Good afternoon to our viewers in Switzerland and good morning to everyone joining us in the Americas. It is a tremendous pleasure to welcome you in the name of the Latin American Chamber of Commerce in Switzerland to this already traditional Finance Outlook webinar, which is offered by our patron UBS. This year, we focus on Latin America in the new world. We are witnessing a shift in geopolitical forces and major changes on the technology front. Amid these and many other challenges, Latin America is exposed to a combination of opportunities and risks, especially when looking at commodity supply and energy transition, but also in coping with high levels of violence. Today, we will hear about the implications on the economic and investment outlook for the region. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Chief Investment Officer, Emerging Markets Americas at UBS Global Wealth Management in New York, who has graciously accepted to be with us already for the third time in a row. He is also one of the World Economic Forum's young global leaders and has just participated at the annual meeting in Davos. A very warm welcome, Alejo Cervonko. Thank you, Tatiana, very much. What a pleasure to be here for the third uh, consecutive year. Before I give you the floor, I have the honor to welcome our board member and head of Latin America at UBS Wealth Management in Zurich, Matthias Musch, who has had behind him a tough year of merging for, uh, teams from Credit Suisse and UBS and kindly agreed to say a few introductory remarks. A warm welcome to you too, Matthias. Thank you very much, uh, Tatiana, and welcome, everybody. Uh, I know that you have a major event to attend, so I don't want to take any more time away and invite you to go ahead, please. Okay, thank you very much, Tatiana, and uh, thanks for thanks for having me. You just said it; uh, it's been you said it was a tough year, but I would say it was an exciting year. Uh, well, we are going to talk in a second. Well, uh, my colleague uh, Alejo Cervonko is going to talk in a second about changes that uh, the world is facing, but also very quickly. Well, as you all know, since March last year, also UBS has been changing quite a bit. I would say together. Well, we are not together with Credit Suisse. Um, as you all well known, uh, what does that mean for Latin America? That means, um, first of all, um, that we are now, and uh, I want to say this uh, with a lot of proud, we are now number one as a foreign bank in, in the region um, after, this, uh, after this acquisition. Um, so we have now a very strong footprint, not only obviously in our home market, uh, Switzerland, and also in, in the US, but also we have uh, strong local presences in Mexico, in Chile, in Brazil. We have a very big bank, uh, which was a former part of Credit Suisse, but also advisory and rep offices in Chile and in Colombia. Yeah? So, um, but obviously with this uh, size also come more responsibilities. Um, as you can know, as you know, we are very committed to Latin America, Latin America, and you can hear that in any presentation of Sergio Ramotti, also Iqbal Khan is mentioned as one of the most, most important growth opportunity. Um, and uh, we are now working hard to really make this transaction or to get off the transaction the best the best result for our clients yeah so we are very complementary which is different to some other markets so latin america definitely we do not have the amount of overlaps that you might see for example in switzerland and i think that plays in our favor yeah but our main responsibility is obviously not only to generate the best ideas of our clients but also to to bring our expertise from the region yeah expertise that we get out of the region but also expertise from uh, what is happening outside the U.S. and bring these to our clients in Latin America. And uh, Alejo and myself, we just were both uh, beginning of the year in Uruguay, in Punta Leste, where we traditionally also have our kickoff meeting. Um, and this was the first event in Latin America that we did combined with credits from Credit Suisse, um, from UBS and also from UBS in the U.S. Yeah? So we really want to send a message. We are one team now. We have a lot of talents. We have a lot of ideas and we have a lot of uh, ambition to well to even be stronger for our clients in the future so the message here is count on us uh, we are very committed to latin america we see this as a huge growth opportunity and i think uh, you will hear uh, a lot of more good stories from us in the future with that again thank you for your time i apologize that i cannot cannot be with you throughout the whole sessions but i'm sure that you anyway hear more for alejo than for me so you're in very good hands and with that i will hand over directly to you alejo and thank you very much again Thank you, Matthias. Goodbye. Have a great event. All right. Um, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. 
allow me to maybe first uh, make sure that the slide deck is working and fully visible. Maybe Tatiana, if you can. Yes, it is. Terrific. All right. So exciting year for UBS Credit Suisse, exciting year for Latin America. Um, we titled uh, our year ahead publication globally for 2024, A New World, simply because as Tatiana was highlighting, I think we are experiencing uh, quite a bit of economic volatility, geopolitical uncertainty, and pronounced technological change. Uh, what I want to do today is maybe three things. I want to start by giving you a brief outlook of what the world might look like, because this really matters for Latin America, as always. Um, I will then speak about the region as a unit, as a whole, and I will wrap up by giving you a few highlights of Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, and Peru. Before I begin, I do want to highlight that it is not a happy day or week for LATAM. I think the region lost a uh, very meaningful leader yesterday, former President Sebastián Piñera, uh, to the hands of a helicopter accident. I had the immense privilege to interview him last week at our conference in Sao Paulo, and uh, I it became immediately apparent in person that he's, uh, he was an absolute brilliant uh, person, a brilliant mind that really wanted to do good for his country and for the region overall. So condolences to uh, family, uh, country, absolutely, and, and our uh, Latin America uh, subcontinent, okay? Uh, let me then start off with, with a few remarks. As I said, uh, global outlook. 2024 is not necessarily going to be an easy year from a growth, from a geopolitical perspective, but I do think by and large, the environment will be supportive for Latin America, particularly when it comes to monetary policy and liquidity availability in the US, in Europe and worldwide, in addition to some geopolitical changes that are taking place in the world and that I think are positive for Latin America. Maybe a bit more detail. Um, 2023 was absolutely shocking in terms of the resilience of the US economy. If you think about it, the US Federal Reserve completed its most aggressive monetary policy tightening in 45 years. Historically, this poured a lot of cold water on the U.S. economy. In addition, we had very pronounced geopolitical shocks. Um, I don't have to remind everybody, you know, what took place around October 7 and subsequent weeks. So um, in this context, the fact that the U.S. economy has continued to grow sizably above our estimate of potential is remarkable. Um, with the information we have today, we're working with a baseline scenario of a US economy that experiences a soft-ish landing in coming quarters. That is growth that moderates, but no recession. Uh, in addition, we're projecting economic activity out of China to stabilize in the four to four and a half percent year over year range. Um, and by and large, growth dynamics out of Europe to trend roughly sideways, right? In this context of more muted growth in the US, in China, and in Europe, I think inflation in particularly America and Europe will continue to be relatively well behaved. That is not necessarily hit persistently the 2% targets, but remain close enough to allow central banks, the Fed, the ECB, to finally deliver easing of monetary policy. As you can see on the left-hand side, that is our expectation of 
you know, where Fed funds can be by the end of this year. We're penciling in roughly 1% of lower policy rates out of the US. Um, it's possible that the first rate cut takes place in May, maybe more likely we're looking at a second half of the year where the Fed will deliver cuts. The European Central Bank might come behind, but it is also more likely than not that we'll see some, some degree of easing of monetary policy out of Europe. And of course, this for Latin America is, is, is not bad news at all because uh, uh, when, when the Fed, the ECB cut interest rates, availability, liquidity becomes more available for countries around the world, and in particular for Latin American sovereigns and Latin American corporate issuers, which is good news. Um, of course, the other big source of global uncertainty is geopolitics. As you know, and maybe you've heard me say this before, we have solidly transitioned from a unipolar world to a multipolar world. Multipolarity is an environment that is more prone to tensions conflict between countries, also within countries. And I think as investors, as decision makers, we simply need to grow, unfortunately, accustomed to permanently higher geopolitical uncertainty moving forward. Uh, I think we are in an environment in which rogue states feel emboldened uh, to crave, um, uh, to uh, design their, their spheres of influence. And that's why you know, you're seeing um, more assertive state actors, right? Think the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, uh, but also more assertive non-state actors, right? Think about maybe Iran is trying to influence some behavior, but there's a lot of behavior that Iran is beyond its its reach of control, right? And in terms of what you're seeing in the Red Sea and and beyond, so um, I think this is a reality. Uh, I'll talk in a few minutes why this might not be such bad news for Latin America specifically. Um, finally, regarding the, the global backdrop, despite this economic uncertainty and geopolitical uncertainty, our view is that given what markets are discounting in terms of um, equities and fixed income valuations, uh, we are projecting investors will be able to obtain total returns in 2024 for balance portfolios that are positive. Uh, for some asset classes, these total returns are quite modest in terms of what we expect. You can see here our target for S&P 500 for the end of the year is 5,000, which really doesn't show a lot of upside. Maybe we see a bit more upside in other global equity markets, such as Europe, such as the emerging markets. Um, but nonetheless, Putting it all together, we think global equities can deliver uh, mid-single digit returns in 2024. In addition, income has returned to fixed income, and so investors can take advantage of uh, better carry in sovereign bonds, in investment grade bonds, be very selective about high yield bonds. So again, this environment for global assets is a decently good environment for Latin American assets as well, where we think selectively you can get a little bit higher returns in certain places of Latin America when compared to global counterparts. Okay, um, let's talk specifically now about Latin America as a region. Um, Tatiana highlighted I had the opportunity to be in, in the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos. One of the uh, key takeaways of the debates I was able to participate in was that in this evolving geopolitical world, there are certain countries, regions that, if they do things right, could benefit from this reality. Uh, to be precise, you could see India very present in Davos and very aggressively selling the opportunities that the definition of a geopolitical swing state or, or middle power offers. In addition, you had representatives from 
uh, the GCC countries, Gulf Corporation countries, right? I'm thinking about Saudi Arabia, UAE, United Arab Emirates, um, uh, Qatar, right? Also very confident that um, they are in a good position in this fractured geopolitical order. What I can share with you is that there was widespread agreement in Davos that Latin America is another region that um, stands to benefit. And we agree. Growth in Latin America looks likely to accelerate in coming years relative to the, say, five-year average growth rates that we saw pre-pandemic, as illustrated in, in this chart. Why is this? I think Latin America can position itself as a dependable supplier of key commodities, soft commodities, industrial commodities, precious metals. In addition, it can position itself as a dependable ally in the global energy transition plan. And finally, uh, selective um, part, parts of Latin America can really clearly benefit from the reorganization of global supply chains. For all these reasons, I personally believe that the region is experiencing a once in a generation opportunity. Of course, it takes two to tango. You gotta go and take advantage of the opportunity. Uh, frankly, uh, I think that the leadership that is currently in general terms in place from a political perspective in the region leaves quite a bit to be desired. It's uh, a fairly poor in quality. The opportunity is not being fully taken advantage of. And I can give you concrete examples about Davos. Uh, no senior Mexican representative was there from the public sector. Brazil, um, Lula wasn't there, Fernando Haddad wasn't there, Marina Silva was there. I think Brazil can do better in terms of selling itself to the world. Chile, nobody of any weight from the public sector was in Davos. Peru, only Velarde, president of the central bank, nobody else. Colombia, yes, President Petro was there. I would argue that his speech, his focus is extremely backward looking and not forward looking enough to grab this opportunity by the horns, right? And leave some of the issues from the past and try to start looking forward into this, this new world, right? So by and large, look, the opportunity is there for Latin America. Um, it's not gonna go away overnight. I'm thinking about this as a multi-quarter or even multi-year window, uh, but the time, the clock is ticking, right? And so far, if Latin America has benefited from this evolving geopolitical world order, has been despite some of the policy decisions and not because of some of the domestic policy decisions. So developing story, and uh, I hope that we wake up and finally start to uh, take advantage of this. Very good. Let me now move on to maybe some country by country highlights. And I wanna start with, with Mexico by highlighting that we're seeing a fairly good macroeconomic picture and a country that is of course the main candidate to benefit from the ongoing reorganization of global supply chains, uh, also known as near shoring. Um, when you look at you know, the, the picture of, of Mexico relative to other emerging markets and relative to other developed markets, you see fairly resilient growth, well-behaved inflation, an external sector that remains in good shape, monetary policy that at least up to this date remains professional and responsible and orthodox, right? And a fiscal policy backdrop that uh, despite some slippage in 2024 in an election year uh, has performed a lot better than most expected when Andres Lopez Obrador took office. So I think uh, when you couple that with the reality that um, 
billions of dollars are coming into Mexico, particularly the northern part of the country, to take advantage of uh, this, this supply chain reorganization. We are decently constructive on the outlook for Mexico. I would argue uh, billions, uh, billions of dollars a year are coming in in terms of foreign direct investment into the country. If Mexico more proactively try to take advantage of the opportunity, billions of dollars a month could be coming into the country. So what I see from a policy perspective is a pretty large opportunity cost. It's not that the country is doing badly. I think the country could be doing a lot better. Um, now, let me offer a, a glass half full also observation. As you know, it's going to be a 2024 very heavy on elections in North America. We've got the U.S. election and we've got the Mexico election. Um, uh, I like to argue that this year, the Mexico election is the developed market election and the U.S. election is the emerging market election. When you think about how much visibility you have into one or the other, I would argue that the visibility in terms of the U.S. election is incredibly low. I wouldn't even dare give uh, a projection of who might win, right? And even if you knew who might win, policy choices are very unclear for one candidate more than the other, but very unclear overall. In Mexico, on the other hand, for better or for worse, you have a candidate that has a very clear path to victory, and you have an alternative candidate uh, that could surprise. In each case, policy priorities seem decently clear, right? It's not, uh, you're never gonna get full certainty, but seems decently clear. So, so look, in, in a world in which politics and geopolitics uh, matter, and investors are quite um, concerned about you know, what's going on in terms of places like the US election, I think the visibility in terms of the Mexican election is a relative plus. Uh, in this context, we do find attractive investment opportunities. We think the Mexican peso will continue to behave relatively well. Some have uh, called it for uh, some time the super peso. Um, a moderate depreciation might be in store, but nonetheless, uh, fairly good behavior overall. Let me allow, uh, go on to Brazil, the uh, other very large economy in the region. What I would highlight there is uh, it is a, a economy that has completely outperformed expectations of growth in terms of uh, how well-behaved inflation has, has become this year, how professional and ahead of the global curve Brazil monetary policy has been conducted, how incredibly strong the external sector of the Brazil economy has been. You can see here in one picture, a, um, a very large uptake of commodity exports by Brazil, particularly soy and oil, right? And so in, in, in this context, um, we're also constructed about the macroeconomic outlook for Brazil. The Achilles heel, right, the weak link in any analysis of Brazil macroeconomics is, of course, fiscal accounts. Um, this is something that, as investors, you get to coexist with for a prolonged uh, period of time. It has no easy solution. Brazil has a local currency debt issue and will continue to have it as far as the eye can see. However, I would argue that uh, the Lula administration with Fernando Haddad as uh, finance minister have managed this weakness fairly decently. And I would expect this to continue moving forward. So it's a controlled risk, I would I would argue. In this backdrop, uh, we also find attractive investment opportunities in Brazil. I expect, for instance, the Brazilian REI to move roughly sideways in coming quarters, maybe in the range of 4.75 to 5 against the US dollar. This means there's nice carry opportunities in Brazilian fixed income. There are terrific companies operating out of Brazil in terms of quality of their business model and management teams. 
And so we we allocate quite a bit of capital to uh, this these companies on the fixed income and also on the equities space. Argentina, a very idiosyncratic story, as you very well known by now, you've got four types of countries. You've got developed markets, emerging markets, Japan, and Argentina. I think this will continue to be the case for the rest of our professional careers, meaning you got to analyze it standalone. It goes against the grain. It's very specific. Um, of course, we all know Javier Milei was elected uh, late 2023. And I think his diagnosis of what's wrong with the Argentine economy is the correct one. Uh, he points out, number one, as you can see in this chart, uh, the country spends aggressively above what comes in to fiscal accounts, and that cannot persist. In addition, he points out it is impossible to do business in the country, given taxation levels, red tape, um, uh, and so something has to change. Look, I think that... Millet put together a high quality working team across a, num a number of areas. Um, I think that uh, Millet has erred on the side of being overly aggressive compared to erring on the side of being overly, um, let's call it um, uh, soft and, and gradual. Right. We know from past experience that the soft and gradual approach does not work in Argentina. So I think it's a good thing that we're trying the other extreme. Of course, um, uh, his administration saw a pretty sizable setback overnight in terms of the omnibus bill that was um, tabled in Congress after a fairly prolonged debate. Um, I do not think this is the end of the story by any means. They have plan B, they have plan C, they have the conviction, and they will try to continue to push for, number one, the fiscal consolidation that the country desperately needs. Number two, the easing of doing business that the country absolutely necessitates. Uh, and so uh, it is a developing story. My assessment by and large is that Argentina faces a pretty binary set of outcomes from here on, either Millet keeps pushing and succeeds eventually in managing these two issues. Um, I think success means the approval of a good number of structural reforms and a president that finishes his four year, year term. That's my definition of success. Uh, but you gotta contemplate, it's simply impossible not to recognize that there is an alternative scenario, more negative scenario in which uh, he's unable to deliver. And uh, I think we got to be open to the possibility that he doesn't finish the term, right? And so we stand in my assessment in, an, in a fairly binary situation. Uh, I think it's more likely that we see the upside scenario than that we see the downside scenario. But like in any binary kind of situation, you want to manage your exposure to Argentina smartly. I'll wrap up with a few thoughts on uh, Chile, Colombia, and Peru, the Andean economies. I would say in all three, levels of domestic political noise have come down. They remain higher than in history, but they have come down. And the focus on 2024 will shift to economic performance. It's here where, you know, we observe for this country's uh, an okayish economic performance with growth for each of these economies in the ballpark of 2%. I would argue this is, of course, fairly low, given historical standards and given the potential that these countries can offer. Inflation uh, continues to normalize, particularly in Chile and in Peru, a bit less marked um, uh, the normalization out of Colombia. The external side of, uh, the, of, of the economies are in manageable health in all three cases. 
And we have seen, of course, uh, more challenging fiscal dynamics out of Chile, Colombia, and Peru in recent years. Uh, some normalization as of late, particularly in Chile and Peru, a bit less so than in Colombia. So I think the key message here is, I think we're gonna be able to breathe a little easier from a political perspective in all three countries. In none of these three have we fully resolved the sources of political and social tension. Um, so this will remain an open debate in coming years, but it's a it's a year of refocusing on economic fundamentals. And so in in Chile, I gave you you know a, a brief a brief highlight of of how we see things. Um, of course, the peso has been under uh, a fair, fair degree of pressure in, in recent months, recent days, 15% uh, down against the dollar in the last 12 months. You can see ranking towards the bottom of the emerging markets uh, a table. Uh, and again, in the, last, in the last 12 months, in terms of uh, 12 month spot returns, this has a lot to do again with refocusing on monetary policy, fiscal policy. And in the case of Chile, maybe a central bank that came out of the gate uh, a bit more aggressive than uh, conditions justified in terms of easing. Uh, in Colombia, uh, it is the most fundamentally challenged of the three uh, of the three Andean economies, particularly when it comes to inflation, particularly when it comes to fiscal accounts. However, given what's priced thin in our analysis, we think the outlook for Colombian assets, it's a little better than investors anticipate. And finally, in, in Peru, um, I think we are seeing a convergence to some degree of policy, politics and the economy. The eternal debate in Peru is, uh, you know, it's Teflon Peru. No matter what happens on, on the political side, the economy continues to work along, right? And I think finally, people are coming to terms with the idea that uh, the, the economy won't be as dynamic as it used to be unless you start getting your ducks in a row from a political perspective. And so I think this is having a number of, of consequences. Very good. With that, let me, Tatiana, make a pause. I think we've covered a good amount of ground. I want this to be, to the extent possible, a conversation rather than simply yeah, you know, speech on, on my side. Um, and before we open it up to questions, Tatiana, I just wanted to emphasize that those who find this type of analysis interesting, uh, I invite you to follow us on, on um, Spotify or Apple Podcasts, where we have a podcast in Spanish, we have a podcast in Portuguese. Of course, we have a podcast in English too. Uh, in the Spanish and Portuguese versions, we try to analyze Latin American topics from um, New York, from Zurich, from, from, from other places, right? Uh, so that's one invitation. And the second invitation is uh, to, you know, get closer on LinkedIn where we run newsletters, and I personally have a monthly newsletter that you can sub subscribe to. We, I write about these topics and, and more. All right, over to you, Tatiana. Very good, thank you very much, Alejo. I have sent a message to our viewers in the chat that they can submit their questions in the Q&A section, I have no questions for the moment, which is very strange. I expect there to be um, some question very soon. Now, yeah, um, while, 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 we, while wait, we wait, go ahead. Yes, no, go ahead, please. Uh, I, I was just going to emphasize, um, you know, I, I talked about Davos, mm -hmm. the sentiment, maybe the gap between uh, what people think of Latin America in this changing global environment and, uh, you know, the thin participation of Latin American political leaders in, in Davos, which I think is a missed opportunity. Um, we had a, a 3,000 
People Conference in Sao Paulo last week. And um, the same topics came up again, right? And so I think the investor community, those in position of leadership are starting to look at Latin America with different eyes, right? And with positive eyes. Uh, as you know, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Uh, the world is not going through the best of stretches, but, but Latin America is standing out as particularly interesting. Uh, again, let's take advantage of it. Yes, uh, while you're talking about Davos, I was thinking uh, 30 years ago, and Linda Walker, our vice president, will remember because that's when we met. I worked in Davos, and uh, we had huge Latin American delegations from uh, Argentina, Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, and uh, Chile, and they were regulars. They came every year, heads of state with a lot of ministers and a lot of private sector. So now we have a couple of questions. Let me take them by order. So we have one from Thomas Nett. How does the UBS see the evolution of the socio-political and economic situation in Ecuador? It's a good opportunity, Thomas, to maybe um, highlight that, you know, this, this positive view that folks have of, of Latin America in, in a changing geopolitical backdrop is not without recognizing that as a region, we face a number of uh, limitations or serious challenges. I talked about maybe leaders that um, are not rising up fully to the occasion. Uh, but in addition, we've got institutions that are on the fragile side. And maybe most important to your question, we do not have any degree of conflict between countries. Right, with the exception of this um, um, crazy Venezuela Guyana situation, which I would heavily discount us in terms of any probability of occurring. But we do have tension in, inside some countries. Organized crime is, is an issue, right? And I think Ecuador is one exponent, Mexico to a good degree is another exponent, parts of Central America. As well, this might explain, as we all know, the popularity of uh, Bukele in, in El Salvador. Uh, I think that the, the economic and, uh, and security situation in, in Ecuador will remain uh, quite, quite challenging. So um, I think this will continue to weigh on, on growth. Um, it will continue to weigh on the opportunity for the country, again, another country that could potentially, partially take advantage of, you know, its role as maybe a commodity exporter, uh, helping in the energy transition, getting energy financing, uh, uh, and, and, and finally, uh, adding its two cents to the reorganization of global supply chains, given its geographic location. So um, cautious on Ecuador per se. I share a pretty constructive view on Mexico, a pretty constructive view on Brazil, uh, a, a somewhere in between view for Chile, Colombia, Peru, uh, uh, a, a one of a kind, one in a kind view for Argentina. Maybe Ecuador falls in towards the bottom of this distribution. We have a question from Linda Walker. How will a Trump or Biden presidency affect Latin America? Um, it is a it is a good question, and I think that from my initial comments on the lack of visibility of the U.S. presidential election, uh, you get a sense that my conviction level on this answer is going to be low, Linda. What I would say is, um, unfortunately. Latin America does not re, does is not an external policy priority for the United States, likely in any event, uh, which I think again is 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 not um, uh, it's not ideal. Uh, and the reason I say this is because you know you simply have to look at the 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 trips that different presidents and different uh, foreign ministers make from the US to abroad, right? And 
uh, where where is uh, Blinken going, right? Blinken's going to uh, the Middle East. If I'm not mistaken, he's been to the Middle East seven times since October 7, seven times since October 7. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, he hasn't been to Latin America, um, right? Uh, uh, and so my point, my point here is you get a Middle East that, is a very high policy priority. You get a Russia Ukraine that's a very high policy priority. You got a, a, a China US relationship that is incredibly important for the United States. Um uh the, the Latin America unfortunately becomes somewhat of an afterthought. And I don't think that the Biden administration has a clear and well crafted strategy for the region. Uh, nor did Trump used to have one either. And therefore, I'm not very optimistic that um, we'll see a change, uh, whoever wins. Um, and and therefore, um, I guess it's going to be more of a private sector initiative to take advantage of the opportunity rather than, you know, leaders in Latin America or in the U.S. coming together. The next question is from an anonymous viewer. I think it probably hints to last year's webinar, Latin America and the Year of um, Inflections. It says last year, all predictions were far away from reality. What are you doing differently to get assurance this year? Um, I'd love to you know, sit down and maybe review line by line. Um, this is... Uh, as you can imagine, uh, it, it, a tough game. Let me give you one example. When you look at uh, the largest hedge fund in the world, right? One that is incredibly successful and has delivered multi-billion dollar gains for its investors. Um, they regularly highlight that success means being right 53% uh, of the times. That means uh, success means being wrong 47% of the times. Uh, so I think the message here is, I don't know exactly what the question's targeting, but we will be wrong very often. The hope is that we are right more often than we are wrong. And as you can see from these numbers, the odds can be pretty slim, right? Uh, and so um, that's the answer that I can give without, you know, if if we want to follow up with some specific calls, we can we can reassess. The next question is from our honorary ambassador, Dr. Philip Nell. Peru had the strongest economic growth in Latin America between 2005 and 2015. What should be done to get back to a strong growth path? Yeah, I hinted at this uh, answer a few minutes ago, Philip. I would say that um, in in Peru, uh, we've had a very unstable and very dysfunctional political system for the better part of the last decade, right? And initially, this had a muted impact on the economy. But I think that by now it's becoming increasingly clear that is that that is no longer the case, and and so I think, you know, what do we need to go back to strong growth? I think we need back to we we, we need a, a bit more political and policy uh, stability, right? Uh, at least being confident that whoever leads the country will be able to do so. That um, you know, Congress. Uh, is able to operate and pass legislation, which quite honestly, without a political reform, uh, it is unlikely we'll see that. And as you know, there's very little appetite for uh, a, a a political a political reform, and and therefore, um, it's it's challenging, right? the The other reality is, you know, without stable politics, without stable um, uh, Congress and a functional relationship between, between the two powers, you're not seeing any 
reform efforts, right? Any efforts to modernize the, the economy, to flexibilize uh, labor markets, to encourage uh, foreign direct investment, uh, all of which I think is acting as an economic drag. Um, look, and I think maybe most importantly, uh, and this not only applies to to Latin to to Peru, but Latin America more broadly, we are not seeing an ability to focus on the topics of the future, right? Um, we've talked uh, a lot about so far supply of commodities, energy transition, near shoring. But, but uh, you know, one area that maybe this is a good opportunity to highlight is that uh, generative AI has brought along a, a phenomenal revolution uh, in the way, uh, you know, we operate. And this is only going to continue and perhaps accelerate. Um, countries like the United Arab Emirates, uh, for all of their challenges, set up what's called a Ministry of Artificial Intelligence, uh, a government unit that attempts to prepare the country uh, to lead in this area. I think in Latin America, we're being extremely re reactive when it comes to, to this and, and, and not putting, you know, getting ready for a technological future anywhere near the top of the policy priorities, right? And and that that worries me because of the internal conflict. The next question is from His Excellency Alfredo Raggio, Ambassador of Uruguay to Switzerland. What do you think of the risk of credit crunch in the development of Latin American companies? Alfredo, thank you for the question. It is most uh, relevant and maybe justifies a bit of historical backdrop. I teach a class at Columbia University and the core uh, message of, of the class is, hey, global liquidity cycles matter. They matter greatly for developing countries and Latin America. If you think about what happened in the last decade of the 80s, right? It was a product of, in good part, Paul Volcker in the US Federal Reserve, hiking interest rates, draining liquidity, very aggressive in the last late 70s, early 80s. If you think about the subsequent crisis in Latin American emerging markets of the 90s, the Kila crisis, right? Um, uh, 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 Russia, Southeast Asia, uh, Brazil, uh, Argentina. These were in good part the product of tightening of financial conditions by Greenspan, right, in, in 94. And so your question is, is spot on. We are coming out of the tight, the, the most aggressive tightening of monetary policy by the Fed in 45 years, as I said before, right? And so you would have expected, based on history, Latin America, something to break from a financial perspective. And uh, it didn't. Uh, and I think this has to do with uh, a number of factors. Uh, we've learned from our mistakes in the past. I think... Number one, there's a lot more debt out there that is denominated in local currencies, Mexican peso, Brazilian real, Chilean peso, Colombian peso. And this is uh, shock absorbing, not shock uh, expanding, right? Whenever you see a tightening of financial conditions. So that's one mitigating factor. The other mitigating factor is we've given, we've given our central banks independence to act from political forces. And so if you think about this monetary policy cycle, Brazil, Mexico, Chile, for example, Colombia to some degree, Peru, they've all moved ahead of the rest of the world in terms of hiking interest rates and cutting interest rates. This is absolutely fascinating. We've never seen this before. And it is uh, you know, something to congratulate Latin America for. Um, finally, I would say, you know, you focus your question on Latin American companies, Alfredo. I would argue uh, you've got 
you know, gr great management, uh, very trained in crisis, very flexible in their mindset, uh, leading uh, some of the Latin American champions, right? And we find them across the region. It's not just one country. And, and therefore, this is also, I, I think, a, a positive factor uh, to, to allow you to, to, to avoid a credit crunch. Uh, Alfredo, concretely, I do not think that you will see a massive spike of defaults in Latin American corporates from now on. Um, I think they've weathered the storm. Indeed, what comes ahead is easing of monetary policy from the Fed, which should help um, them, uh, you know, give them an easier time. Next question from an anonymous viewer. What is the outlook for Brazilian industry? When will we see more balanced export sector, commodities and manufacturing? Where can we find UBS info on Latin American equity? Very good. Um, regarding Brazilian industry, we do think this year, 2024, will uh, show maybe a more even performance of economic sectors. Last year, 2023, saw the primary sector, uh, that is a lot of commodity exports, uh, hitting it out of the park, doing extremely well relative to the rest of the economy. We do think this is a year in which you'll see more balance. Uh, why? In good part, because um, uh, interest rates in Brazil are off their peaks. Uh, availability of credit is a bit more generous. The ongoing uh, reorganization of supply chains globally helps some Brazil players. And so I think uh, the, the, you, you start to see it most likely in, in 2024. In 20, um, uh, regarding info on, on UBS LATAM equity, uh, you know, we, we produce that work, it's available. Um, some of what we do is public, right? And and this is an example. And some of what we do is available to to clients. But feel free to reach out, and we'll make make sure to make the connection and, and get get you access to that analysis. Next question from Jonathan Zahnbrecher: What are the leading countries in green energy investments, like wind energy? Um, I, I think I think you're seeing, to be very frankly, Jonathan, this is not you know my very close area of expertise, so I'm gonna lack on on details in in my answer. I think what I've seen is is Brazil is is a strong exponent of a very sustainable energy matrix compared to other countries in 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 the world. Uh, and Latin America, more broadly, given the you know uh, benefits of of you know sunlight and wind and um, uh, uh, water streams, are well positioned to tap on on this opportunity. Um, we do a lot of work in this area. We have a sustainable investing team that is well populated. Uh, Jonathan, maybe we can follow up with you and and do a double click on on where specifically for wind energy. Uh, so what is the opportunity overall, right? And uh, where specifically in Latin America, we see more, more, more edge. Next question comes from Enrique Rebassa. You mentioned the divorce of politics and business economy for Peru. From what I see in Peru is that businessmen are not investing here. What I see, they put breaks. What do you see? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry if that didn't come across. I agree with you, Enrique, today, right? Um, <clears throat> what I try to emphasize is Peruvian political volatility uh, is not new. Uh, we've been coexisting with this for the better part of the last decade. Uh, my argument was, at least initially, there was this perception and in part reality that the economy could keep humming along even if politics uh, didn't cooperate. And, and it, for, for a few years it did, uh, but now I don't think that is true anymore. And what you argue, right? Uh, let me uh, emphasize again, you, you're saying what I see is that business 
uh, participants are putting the brakes, right? And, and, and I think you're, you're by and large right, and not only domestically, uh, but also externally. So it is, uh, without a doubt, a source of concern today. It didn't used to be. Next question is anonymous. In your view, which foreign investment project would stand out during 2024, 25? Um, look, that we we don't look at we invest in public in public equity and and, and public um, and bond markets, right? So, um, it's not it's not what, what we focus on. What I can tell you is that I think the bulk of foreign direct investment flows in Latin America in 2024 and 2025 are likely going to go to Mexico and to Brazil, not only because of the size of their economy, but also because of the their over, overall economic picture, political situation, and ability to exploit on the changing nature of the world today. Um, yes, that's what I would say. And I think it was an anonymous user too. Another anonymous, where should Latin America look to USA, Europe or China? And in Europe, who? The beauty of the current environment is that I need not answer with one single country, right? Um, so the concept of a geopolitical swing state or a middle power is becoming more commonplace. This is a country that is big enough, influential enough, not to be forced to pick sides, right? And in a world in which you've got different centers of economic and geopolitical power, the US, Europe, China. If you're a middle power, if you're a geopolitical swing state, you don't have to say, hey, I'm going all in with the US or I'm going all in with Europe or with China. You can try to stay somewhere in a gray area and extract concessions from your different partners. Um, I think good parts of Latin America can try to do this. I believe Brazil is absolutely the most clear example of a country that can pull this off, right? Uh, maybe to some extent, Chile, Colombia, Peru can play a similar game. Uh, the country that doesn't really have much option, quite honestly, as we all know, is Mexico. Uh, too far from God, too close to the United States, that will continue to be the case. And therefore, I think Mexico should throw itself 100% at the opportunity in front of it through a, a United States alliance, right? And should be very careful with the Mexico link. As you might be familiar with um, the share of U.S. imports that comes from Mexico has increased quite a bit in recent years, but also the share of Mexican imports that come from China have increased as well. So uh, I'm concerned that maybe uh, uh, the U.S. will start to think, hey, uh, is Mexico simply becoming, in part, you know, a cover for China, uh, China goods going going through Mexico? But but look, that's that's a, that's something that can be mitigated. Uh, I think that your question was very interesting, particularly because the answer need doesn't need to be uh, X, Y, and Z. And we have a last question from Daniel Otero. In a hypothetical case that Trump wins the presidency, in your opinion, how would that affect the nearshoring boom in Mexico? Do you think it would impact investors with his speech of nationalism and promote the return of U.S. companies to the U.S.? Um, I, I do think that Trump will continue to try to promote the return of U.S. companies to the U.S. That is happening as we speak, too. I, I think... We do not, I, I see that, Danielle, the spirit of your question, which is we had a first Trump presidency in which he was very aggressive against Mexico and he renegotiated NAFTA. Uh, and, and, you know, might we see something similar? And, and I think rhetorically, 
um, rhetorically, it's, it might not be a pretty environment, but in practical terms, now USMCA is Trump's baby, right? And so I don't think that he needs to go that aggressively against that. We know we need we know the rules of the road. We know, I I think it's pretty straightforward to understand that a strong economically strong Mexico is also good for the U.S. in terms of migration flows and a key source of concern. So Daniel, in short, I would not take the last example as uh, what you should expect if he wins the president presidency again, I would expect a, a, a better bilateral relationship and near shoring to continue. Well, it is unfortunately time to wrap it up. Our deepest thanks, Alejo Cervonko, for highlighting the perspectives for Latin America in this complex and uncertain new world and for providing added value and candid views, reminding us that it is not enough uh, that opportunities are there, but they also need to be seized. It has been, as always, a highlight and a real treat to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, my pleasure. Looking forward to seeing everybody again soon. Crossing fingers, it can be in person. Um, do get um, in, in touch through LinkedIn. Uh, so that we maintain the conversation. Have a great day, Tatiana. Thank you, Alejo. Dear viewers, thank you for connecting and engaging in our virtual debate. You will receive the Zoom inquiry tomorrow, so don't be shy to send me any questions that you feel have not been answered. Also, you will be able to view Alejo's presentation on our website, I believe, under this event. Can you send it to me, Alejo? Is that a call? Yes, yes, of course. Wonderful. And in case you missed part of today's session, the recording will be uploaded as usual to our YouTube channel, LATCAM Switzerland. If you're interested in listening to Alejo's comments on a more regular basis and in Spanish or Portuguese, as he already pointed out, he records a podcast every couple of weeks, which is called UBS LATCAM Access en Español o en Portugués. Once more, thank you for connecting and hope that you will join us again on the next occasion soon. Till then, be safe and goodbye.